and welcome to the second part of our lecture on movement and movement disorders. Today we're going to be talking about motor systems. In our previous lecture we talked about muscles and muscle control. And we're going to now look at the neural systems underlying control of those muscles. So we'll start the general look at the hierarchical structure of the motor system uh, starting from the motor units on up. And then we're going to take each of those components of that hierarchical system and look at them individually. So we'll talk about motor tracts, then we'll talk about the cerebellum, the basal ganglia, then move up to the cortex, talk then some about uh, motor learning and conscious decision and movement. So first of all, we'll start with the lowest part of the motor system, which are motor units, and we talked about this in our previous lecture, which are muscle fibers uh, innervated by a single axon, or a single neuron. And so a single neuron may innervate four or five muscle fibers. That's a motor unit. When that neuron fires, all of those muscle fibers will fire at the same time. Now, one thing we didn't talk about, which I did want to mention, is we don't, when we contract a muscle, we don't usually um, use all of the muscle fibers at the same time. We alternate from some muscle, or sorry, motor units at the same time. And so we incorporate or use some of the motor units, which is why they don't fatigue necessarily as rapidly. This is also why people can suddenly have great feats of strength um, due to high stress situations like a child trapped under a car. You hear these sort of apocryphal stories. But what happens is they're able to incorporate every muscle fiber all at the same time. And so you can uh, sort of have these feats of sudden super strength. Now the problem is, is that our bodies aren't designed for that kind of stress and you can't sustain that. Um, very long and you're certainly going to be very sore and probably very injured afterwards. Um, a lot of people if they could uh, incorporate or use all of their motor, tr or motor units at the same time could potentially injure themselves, uh, tear tendons, ligaments, even break bones, that sort of thing. Uh, all of these things are um, potentially possible, although certainly unlikely. And that's the reason why we have these safety mechanisms uh, that keep us from overexerting those muscles uh, and causing damage. So those are the motor units. Then we have motor tracts. These are specific tracts that um, go to specific uh, parts of the body and, in, and uh, are involved in specific types of motor movements, which we'll talk about. The cerebellum and the basal ganglia are then the next step up in this system. So the motor tracts go to the motor units. Cerebellum and the basal ganglia are subcortical structures that are highly involved in our motor systems, and we'll talk about these in some detail. Then we have the primary motor area. This is where we start getting to the cortex. The premotor area and the supplementary motor area, and these are the higher up we go in the system, uh, the sort of uh, higher uh, order these are. So the supplementary motor area and the premotor area are involved in planning movements. The primary motor area is involved in sending signals to the correct muscles or the correct parts of the body and those are of course then timed out and accomplished via the, the motor tracts and incorporating the cerebellum and the basal ganglia. There are other motor areas um, as well uh, such as the anterior cingulate, the superior folliculus, and the parietal lobe. Uh, we're mostly going to focus uh, our area on the frontal motor areas including the supplementary, premotor, and primary motor areas. But for example, um, we have motor areas involved in speech that are in the frontotemporal junction um, that are sort of outside of this supplementary motor area. So the motor tracts, uh, these are mechanisms by which movements planned in the brain are sent to their target muscles. So we have corticospinal tracts, which include the lateral corticospinal tract, which controls our distal limb muscles or our farther limb muscles. Our medial corticospinal tract, which controls our trunk, neck, and bilateral movements such as walking. So uh, if we're talking about kicking a uh, football with one foot, uh, we're talking about usually the lateral corticospinal tract. If we're talking about walking or running, we're talking about the medial corticospinal tract. Um, throwing a ball with one arm, that would be um, the distal limb muscles. Uh, so that would be the lateral corticospinal tract. Of course, clapping your hands together involves bilateral movements, which would involve the medial corticospinal tract. The cortical vulvar tract uh, is involved in our face and tongue movements, and the rubrospinal modulates motor movements through input 
between the motor cortex and the cerebellum. So this tract is involved in modulating our motor movements through feedback from the motor cortex and the cerebellum. So stopping motor movements or um, increasing them or decreasing them, so modulating this via a timing mechanism, say, from the cerebellum. The cerebellum modulates uh, ipsilateral muscles, so those on the same side. The vermis is part of the cerebellum that leaks somatosensory and kinesthetic information to the ventromedial tracts. So damage in this area results in postural loss and difficulty in locomotion because we can't sit upright and we can't walk because we can't uh, use those bilateral movements. The intermediate zone forms a loop between the red nuclei and somatosensory information from the spinal cord. Damage here results in an inability to make smooth movements to a target location. So say reaching over to grab a cup of coffee uh, would be the intermediate zone because it can't use somatosensory information um, and uh, provide that information to the red nuclei. We can't get that smooth movement to grab something and pick it up uh, to that kind of target location. So reaching over to grab something and pick it up would involve use of this intermediate zone. The lateral zone is involved in four different types of movement. Ballistic movement, which occurs quickly, but not timed to be modified by feedback. So we talked a little bit about this in our previous lecture. These are these very fast, rapid movements. So for example, throwing a fastball pitch. Once that's started, it's not going to be stopped. Um, reaching to grab something you've dropped. Once you've started that, you're not going to stop that. Um, I once <laughs> dropped a pair of tongs into a deep fryer at work when I was in the restaurant industry, and I reached down and grabbed them and pulled them out um, and didn't even think about it. And then fortunately, there was an ice machine right next to it, and so I shoved my hand in it and actually wasn't even burned really at all. Um, stupid, yes, um, but this kind of ballistic movement was what we were talking about. Multi-joint movements are also involved in the lateral zone. Anything that requires, you know, things like grasping your hands, things like that. Learning of new movements. So if you're trying to learn new uh, ways to move, yoga positions, trying to learn how to ride a bike for the first time, um, trying to learn how to do something like whisk eggs correctly. These are all new kinds of movements uh, that will be involved in uh, incorporating this lateral zone. Finally, the cerebellum, uh, particularly the lateral zone, is involved in temporal processing and timing of movements. And so as we're trying to coordinate movements together and do things like snap to a beat, that would be this kind of temporal processing and timing of movements uh, involved in this, that would be involved with the lateral zone. The basal ganglia are uh, particularly important for modulating our motor movements and keeping involuntary movements from happening. There are four major components of the basal ganglia. We'll talk about what they are and then we'll talk about how they fit together here in a moment. The striatum, which includes the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the nucleus accumbens. It's called the striatum because um, it does have this kind of striped look to it. The globus pilitis uh, has an inhibitory effect on the thalamus. The globus pilitis is sometimes a target for treatment for Parkinson's disease, and what's called the pallidotomy. Uh, the substantia nigra is kind of the key to what's called the nigrostriatal pathway, which we'll talk about here uh, in a bit. And then we have the subthalamic nucleus, and these all work together uh, in a variety of ways. And in particular, we're going to talk about how they work together to form the two major routes through the basal ganglia. The direct route and the indirect route. So here's how uh, these are situated. We have the caudate, sputamen, uh, and the nucleus accumbens, is I don't think uh, marked here. And then we have the substantia nigra. It's called the substantia nigra because it's this black body and that's actually how it looks. The subthalamic nucleus is right next to us. We have the thalamus, which is of course the sensory switchboard. And then here, located beneath the putamen, is the globus pilitis. So on each side, we have the putamen, caudate, and then we have the subthalamic nucleus, the substantia nigra, and the thalamus on each side. And the hypothalamus is located down here. These form a series of inhibitory and excitatory connections. 
And without getting too deep into the weeds on this, let's take a look at how these connections look. So we'd like to draw these excitatory and inhibitory connections in black and red. So the red are inhibitory connections and the black are excitatory connections. Um, the two parts, the external um, part of the globus pallidus and the internal part of the globus pallidus uh, have inhibitory connections. So the external inhibits the subthalamic nucleus, which then excites the internal, which then inhibits the thalamus. Bear with me. The putamen inhibits the globus pallidus. So if the putamen is inhibiting this globus pallidus internal, it's inhibiting the thalamus less. The substantia nigra sends both excitatory and inhibitory connections to the putamen. This is, um, depends on if we're talking about dopamine 1 receptors or dopamine 2 receptors. This is where um, Parkinson's disease has a great deal of its effect is in the substantia nigra. And so the system gets very out of balance. And as a result, sometimes they will remove part of the globus pallidus to try to relieve some of the inhibitory parts of uh, this process to try to rebalance this system or increase uh, levels of dopamine with uh, drugs like L-DOPA. So these excitatory and inhibitory connections form a couple of routes that are involved in different kinds of movements. So inhibition of the glo glo globus pallidus by the putamen causes a reduction of inhibition at the thalamus, thus excitation of the cortex. So we reduce inhibition of the thalamus, we get increased excitation of the cortex. So this is used for sustaining or facilitating ongoing action by limiting this inhibition. The thalamus then is free to respond and send information to the um, supplementary motor area and the primary motor area. And that's why this is involved in sustaining or facilitating ongoing action uh, because we're continuing whatever action we're doing by not inhibiting the thalamus is the key part of this. The indirect route, the striatum, um, which includes uh, the putamen and other parts of the striatum, inhibits the subthalamic nucleus, which in turn activates the globus pallidus, which then inhibits the thalamus. And this is important for suppressing unwanted movement. And so we have to have this kind of balance between the striatum, the subthalamic nucleus, and the globus pallidus to keep from inhibiting it so that we can inhibit or suppress unwanted movement. And so oftentimes Parkinson's patients um, will, uh, or other patients will often have a tremor um, associated with this kind of unwanted movement. And it's due to sometimes a lack of sort of balance in the, glo in the basal ganglia. So these are the two routes through the basal ganglia that I want you to be uh, familiar with. So moving up to the cortex, there's a lot of brain power associated with movement. We have the primary motor cortex, which is located, of course, right next to the primary somatosensory cortex. Uh, we have the supplementary motor cortex, the premotor cortex. Uh, all of these are involved in motor planning. And then, of course, the prefrontal cortex is involved in some of our other um, activities. So we'll start with the primary motor cortex, or what we call M1. This is the precentral gyrus, which is located in the posterior portion of the frontal lobe, just anterior to the central sulcus. This provides the command signal to drive motor neurons to make muscles move. So this is what's activating or sending uh, activity down to um, the motor units to cause them to move. This controls both the force and direction of our motor actions. So the primary motor cortex is involved in sending that information down to the muscles, initiating any movement, voluntary movement. So the fact that I'm talking right now is being coordinated by the primary motor cortex, the fact that I'm moving around which you can't see, all of that uh, is part of the primary motor cortex. And it tells us how much force to apply, which generally means how fast the um, uh, motor units should uh, contract and how many of them should contract at the same time. So if you want to apply a great deal of force, you'll uh, recruit a bunch of motor units to do that at once. So that's uh, occurring at the level of the primary motor cortex. Now an important part 
of understanding this process is understanding what's called a motor plan. This is a plan of action or motor program. And this order in which this goes is from the supplementary motor area to the premotor area to the motor area. And so these sort of plan or motor programs exist in these other cortical areas and then are activated and are sent then to the primary motor cortex, or M1, and then that's the final signal that sends this information down to your muscles. So the supplementary motor area, or the SMA, is involved in planning of movements and abstract representations of a motor plan. So if you're thinking about, uh, for example, if you're trying to think about motor movements involved in some activity, say, playing the piano, your abstract representation of that motor plan is included in the supplementary motor area uh, when you're first trying to learn how to do this kind of movement. Um, this is in the ventromedial frontal, frontal cortex, which is just anterior uh, to the motor cortex. This is active prior to engaging movement. And functional imaging shows activation for complex tasks as well as imagined movement. So as I was saying, if you're imagining, thinking about walking or thinking about throwing a ball or catching a ball um, or imagining yourself doing these activities, you're actually engaging in the supplementary motor area. This is one of the reasons why oftentimes athletes are told to imagine their task. So if they're getting ready to um, do a free throw in basketball, they're told to maybe imagine making that free throw so that they can engage this kind of supplementary motor area ahead of time and with varying degrees of success uh, involved there. So the premotor area, which is anterior to the primary motor cortex and is to the lateral part of the frontal lobe, is involved in basic action, basic motor action. So specific actions, it integrates information about position and posture of the body and organizes the direction of movement in space. This is where we have mirror neurons which are useful for learning to imitate actions. So we're integrating sensory and motor information together in one place. And mirror neurons, as you'll recall, are these um, neurons that respond to both watching someone do something and to uh, engaging in the same activity yourself. So this is useful for learning to imitate actions as well as understanding things like facial expressions. The anterior cingulate uh, its posterior portion is important for controlling or planning of novel or difficult movements and also in selection of motor responses, in particular overriding a response. And so if we start a motor movement and then want to override it, the anterior cingulate is going to be involved in that. So if you start to slap somebody and decide halfway through that you don't want to slap them, the anterior cingulate is going to tell you is what's going to override that response. Um, you know, just for example. Or if you're driving a car, for example, and you go to turn and you see a pedestrian uh, and you stop that motor movement, the anterior cingulate's involved in that. The parietal lobe then is includes both the superior parietal lobe, which integrates sensory information with motor movement, so we get proprioceptive and kinesthetic sensory information that tells us where our body is in 3D space. This is what allows our attention areas to direct our body in the ways that we want to. So we can include information about where our body is in 3D space, whether or not we're getting some sort of force feedback, all of that's occurring in the superior parietal lobe. The inferior parietal lobe is involved in complex movements and in generating a mental model of movement. And so very complicated movements uh, involving a number of steps. So uh, if they say if we're trying to pick a lock, that would be involved in a lot of complex movements, or again, from something like, something like playing a piano or uh, playing the organ, which involves both hands and feet and lots of other complex movements that would be involved here. So learning new skills uh, requires multiple brain areas involved in the control of movement. Uh, the basal ganglia are critical for learning motor skills, in particular organizing sequences of movement and automatic behaviors and new habits. This is part of what we call your implicit memory system. That you can actually oftentimes perform these actions automatically without any conscious control. We also see that the pattern of activity of neurons in the motor cortex becomes more consistent as a new skill is learned. So they start to become, uh, they, start, they start to sort of fall into line, as it were, as we start to learn new motor skills. The last couple notes I want to make in this topic 
uh, let's talk a little bit about conscious decisions and, decisions and movement. The conscious decision to move and the movement itself occur at two different times. So what happens is a readiness potential is a particular type of activity in the motor cortex that occurs before any type of voluntary movement. And it begins at least 200 milliseconds before the movement. This implies that we become conscious of the decision to move after the process has already begun. And people have tried to argue that this indicates that we don't have free will because we have started moving before we are consciously aware of the fact that we are moving. Well, it turns out that other people have done further experiments in this area and you can actually inhibit a movement once it's been started and so you can actually stop a movement even though you know, before it is started. So we do have conscious control, we do have free will, sort of. Um, but here's the basic idea. Um, your brain's readiness potential begins in preparation for the movement. The person reports a conscious decision occurred here, even though we've already started seeing preparation to move. We're consciously aware of it, and then the movement starts. So we become consciously aware of it just prior to it initiating. Uh, and it just shows you that we have this kind of readiness potential. The brain gets ready to move prior to our conscious awareness of actually moving. Final thing just to note um, is there are different levels of um, damage to the spinal cord and result in different types of um, motor movement disorders. Um, we'll just quickly mention this here. We're going to talk about different uh, movement disorders, in particular things like Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease in our next lecture. But we get paralysis, is the lack of voluntary movement in some part of the body, can be due to damage to the spinal cord, motor neurons, or their axons. Paraplegia um, is usually a cut through the spinal cord above the segments attached to the legs. Usually they have um, no sensation below the waist um, and uh, cannot walk. Quadriplegia is a loss of all four extremities, and again we're talking about um, cut through the spinal cord above the segments controlling the arms, and then nothing below that. Hemiplegia is one leg and one arm on one side, so this is usually damage to half of the um, spinal cord or one hemisphere of the cerebral cortex. Um, poliomyelitis is an infection that causes paralysis uh, due to causing damage to cell bodies and motor neurons. Uh, ALS, which is often now called Lou Gehrig's disease, is another disease that can cause um, significant um, loss of motor functioning. We're going to talk about some specific mo movement disorders in our next lecture.